Okay, Park Ridge is, uh, if you're downtown Knoxville and you're getting on Magnolia Avenue, if you're going east on Magnolia, um, Pellissippi, there's a Pellissippi State College right out there, just a, about a mile past uh, where the CAT bus terminal is. So Park Ridge is to the north of Magnolia Avenue and to the west of Cherry Street, forms a, a block right in there. And the primary portion of Park Ridge is the part that we're talking about tonight. So the reason that this is important is how many people in this room know about the historic zoning overlay that they're wanting to put into the Park Ridge community? Well, you all live in Park Ridge, I didn't count. This is Kate Grayville who just walked in. She's gonna be, and I'm so glad she's here because she's the one that actually will talk to us about Park Ridge. Um, so what, so we're dealing with an area in Knoxville that has houses that have historically ranged from um, thirty-five to hundred thousand dollars. About twelve years ago, a portion of the neighborhood uh, was successful in getting a historic overlay placed on it, and now you have properties that are in that part of the neighborhood that are trading at over two hundred thousand dollars. They're going to be expanding, or they're wanting to expand the historic zoning overlay into a larger area, going all the way to Cherry Street, which will be 525 properties approximately. Now the reason I'm saying all this, if you want to make money, I talked about it last month, the difference between real estate investors and real estate investing is that real estate investors monetize information. That's all we do. The moment you begin to work on a piece of property, the moment you start driving hammers and nails or ripping out walls, you are, you are investing in real estate and the only way you can make a profit is to improve the efficiency of a process. You're going to be more efficient at doing repairs and remodeling than somebody else is. Because you can be certain that there have been 25 people who have looked at the house Everybody has some kind of repair estimate in mind, right? So you are the one that is going to be looking at, I can do it for this, and you're the one that buys the property. The difference between monetizing information and real estate investing is really important to understand the dynamics. Because when you say you're having problems finding property, you're not listening to the universe. You're not paying attention to the small details that are around you every day. And the reason that I say this is that I, 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 I own property because of Richard, right back here, the guy with the baby. I feel like, by the way, I feel like I'm responsible for the baby. I mean, they, they were members of the group. Oh, hey, you to talk? <laughs> <laughs> members of the group, and I said, you know, I made the comment, we don't, have any, we don't have any babies in the group. And here we go, they have one. <laughs> so, but Richard, two and a half, almost three years ago now, bought a house in the Park Ridge community. And I, like a lot of people, knew the historic district. I knew the area really, I thought, pretty well. But what I had not paid attention to was the way that the neighborhood had shifted over the previous couple of years. Richard was up close and personal to it. He bought a house that I thought was gonna rent for 650, maybe 675, stone dead. He rented it for 850. More importantly, he had three other people prepared to rent it for the 850, all of whom had credit scores over 800, and all of whom had more than $2,000 in cash to move into the property. Now we're gonna call those good tenants, and that I was wrong. But, because I pay attention to free information, which he volunteered at the meeting, I immediately go to Park Ridge to look to buy a couple of houses, and I bought two, looking to buy four or five more. And the reason, so, I'm in the neighborhood, I'm looking to buy, I know the historic district is looking to expand. I'm wanting to get in the way of the historic district, uh, the historic zoning, the overlay. Okay, will correct me on all the terms that I'm using improperly. <laughs> but what happens is I go to the neighborhood meetings and I hear people talking about they don't want the overlay, they do want the overlay, we want the overlay. It's going to be hard for our, it's going to be bad for people, it's going to be good for people. Everybody's got an opinion depending on where you are in property ownership. I, as an investor, am completely agnostic. 
Now, I say that because I am confident of what happens when the sort of zoning overlays go into place about a property values rise. It's, it's like putting market dynamics on steroids. My view, my opinion. But what happens is the neighbors at these meetings, they come in and they talk about investors as if we are some kind of third world terrorist dictator. And that uh, a Nigerian slum would be a better uh, place for investors to be than in the Park Ridge community or any other community. So I thought that I would do some research to figure out how Park Ridge came about. And I'm sorry that I'm taking too long on this already. But Park City, Park Ridge is part of the Park City area. And it's really important to begin to understand that when everybody talks about this, they talk about this guy, George Barber, who was a really well-known architect in the late 1890s through 1915 when he died in this huge mail order catalog business. And there's a number of George Barber homes in the Park Ridge community. And uh, then they built a number of bungalows. But nobody, and they talk about Barber becoming a partner with the Edgewood Land Company. And they talk about how the Edgewood Land Company created um, uh, this walkable neighborhood. There is no context to any of these conversations at these neighborhood meetings. Because if it were not for investors putting in private capital at our risk into a community, all communities die. And the reason is, in almost every community, 40% of the people who live there are renters. In almost every neighborhood in Knoxville, there's 10% or more of renters. In some neighborhoods in Knoxville, it's 50% or more. But in 1890, 65% of the people who lived in Knoxville, Tennessee, were renters. So, let's go back in time. 1880, so just think about it. In 1880, the city of Knoxville was basically the core of downtown from uh, Jackson um, over to what is now Henry Street. And uh, this area right here, this is First Street, coming around right here, meandering all around at Second Street. This is uh, where the University of Tennessee was located. And in 1880, so in 1878, the city of Knoxville, the business leaders, Woodruff, uh, Strong, some other people that had the buildings named after them, the streets named after them, began saying that Knox was, and we have these fantastic resources, we have this wonderful climate, we've got this great water resource, we need to be telling people about it so we can bring more people to the community, and uh, a rising tide floats all ships, will all become wealthier as more people move in. So they go out and send delegations out to New York and to Chicago and they, uh, to these uh, uh, seminars, and they promote Knox, and they say, what a fantastic town it is. And sure enough, it worked. So in 1880, uh, there were 15,000 people in Knox County. 10,000 people inside the city limits all crammed in there together. 5,000 people living out in the country. In 1886, there were 30,000 people in the county. In uh, 88, when this map was done, updated in, 80, in 1888, there were 38,000 people, right? and 40,000 people in 1890. 20,000 people inside the city limits, and again, this is the city limits, right? I don't know if there's been that many people living inside the city limits since 1890. <laughs> well, this area out here is the Branner farm. And Mrs. Branner lives about right here. And you can imagine how complicated, competitive, the real estate market must be in a town where it goes from 10,000 to 20,000 people in less than 10 years, and the boundaries of the city do not expand. Everybody is looking for something, everybody's raising rents, there's not enough property, everybody knows everybody, so my pretty borders, I didn't get saved, I should have left Ryan and fixed this. This is, uh, we're right here, 1887. The widow, Elizabeth Branner, who, whose husband was in the real estate business, whose son becomes the mayor of Knoxville, and when he becomes the mayor of Knoxville, he, rena he renames 
uh, Craig Avenue right here to uh, his mother's first name, Magnolia. So the so she lived in about a 9,000 or 10,000 square foot house on what is now uh, the Mississippi State campus. The, the school where it was the original, it was so big it was the original Catholic high school in Knoxville, and then they built a new Catholic high school that became Mississippi. I don't know. And so in 1887, the competition for real estate had to be unbelievably intense. So you wind up with Mrs. Branner owning this 150 acres right across First Creek from this burgeoning town, right? And she sells the property to two people named French and Roberts, who are real estate people. Can you imagine two real estate people talking to a widow about buying her property? <laughs> and they buy her property. Can you imagine the competition? because there's probably a thousand people in Knoxville that were trying to do some kind of real estate deal. And everybody's saying, well, Ms. Brander's not gonna sell, she knows everybody. She know, her, her husband was in the business. Her son's a politician. There's no reason to talk to her. She's not gonna sell to me. But French and Roberts talk to her. And French and Roberts buy her property for $19,000. Now, we'll get into the math later, but what's really important about this transaction, I tell everybody, as I said, you never be in a hurry to buy real estate. I always say at the, at the end of the disclaimer, the reason is we've been buying and selling it exactly the same way as we have since the panic of 1893. The reason they call it the Great Depression is that it was worse than the panic of 93, which by the way, is the second greatest recession depression in American history. Half again worse than what we've just been through. So we put this in perspective, the 80s are boom years. There's enormous demand for real estate. Everybody's trying to figure something out and French and Roberts get Mrs. Brander to sell them their 150 acres and 150 acres is $19,000 and more importantly, they're gonna get seller terms. Can you imagine? $19,000 is just a fortune in 1887 and they ask her for seller terms. If they get $4,750 down, the day of closing, and three notes at forty-seven fifty over the next three years. Um, back then, the, uh, the the terms were in. This is before ninety-three when everything changed. But the notes are in the deed, and you can read them for yourself. The interest was separate on a separate note, uh, so the interest rate normally wasn't in the deed itself, but it references the document where the interest is. And in the eighteen nineties, property on Gay Street was selling at an eight percent interest with owner terms. So we're going to say Ms. Brander got 8% interest on her money, right? But the important thing is the buyers got the seller to give them terms of 25% down and the owner carried the rest, of the, the rest of the mortgage. Now, if you go into Fortune Builders or the, they got at Flips Vegas or whoever those other people are, they would talk to you about the, te the technique of being able to get people with paid for property to the new technique, the strategy of getting the seller of the property to provide terms and their own mortgage on the property. In 1887, they were doing exactly the same thing. But what's really interesting, if you're reading anything on Bigger Pockets, you're reading on any of the literature, they'll tell you that what you want to do is you want to do a back-to-back -back closing or you want to do an assignment of your contract so that you never have to really put up any money. And if you do an assignment of your contract, you do a closing, it's like this myst mystical kind of idea that people are promoting as if it's brand new thought process. But in 1897, the same day, the very next recorded deed in Knoxville is that French and Roberts sell land to the um, uh, Edgewood Land Company, and it didn't come out, it's 29000 $618.21. They bought it for $19,000 with owner terms and they sold it immediately in a back to back closing for $29,816.21. Yes? What exactly do you mean when you say owner terms? The owner is providing. Thank you, Chris. The owner, so. The owner, Ms. Branner, owns the property. 
they, she is going to carry the paper. She's going to create her own mortgage, and these people are going to be paying this Branner the mortgage instead of them going to the bank. They're, they're getting the terms from her that they're negotiating that they want to pay. Owner financing, basically. Oh, it, is, it is owner financing of the property, 100% with negotiated terms that the buyer is wanting to have. Right? So Mrs. Branner was acceptable to take 25% down and balance over three years. And most property in the United States prior to 1893 sold on three and four and five year notes, interest only with the principal coming due on the one year anniversary. Right? That's how most of real estate was sold prior to 93, the 1893. And the reason that that gets to be important is that they sold the land for $10,000 pure. In other words, they made a $10,000 profit in 1897 doing a back-to-back -back closing, which if you read other people, they'll talk to you as some new skill, some new technique. They're buying property from a woman who is known to everybody and who knows everybody, and they still turn around and sell the property to a Chattanooga development company with Knoxville Partners and make $10,000 in less than an hour. The, they had, so they received at closing, well look at that, there it is, I just didn't push the buttons far enough. So let's see, how do I get it to advance to the next slide? Let's see. Uh, that's uh, so what I got to do. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> you can see how technological and quite I am, right? So let's put it back in perspective. Um, you're not going to have to ask, 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 answer very many questions, right? Um, the Elmwood Land Company, Mrs. Branner's husband, was the vice president, that was the treasurer of the Elmwood Land Company. They developed all the land on the back side of uh, the Branner farm, all this back in here. So she knows everybody. But in 1885, they do a trolley, a horse-drawn trolley, on this new road, Fifth Avenue. And the horse-drawn trolley uh, goes to the Beeman Farm, which becomes the Beeman Lake in 1887. And so, to summarize, this is the Branner property. The town's blowing up. She sells it to French and Roberts for 19. They immediately sell it for 29,681. Edgewood develops 176 lots on an absolutely green field that was farmland and pasture land before the real estate developers took it over, right? So the real estate developers tore up this green field and made a fortune doing it. Mrs. Branner financed the transaction for the people because she got the enormous sum of $19,000 because Mrs. Branner thought that that would, and her advisors told her that was an enormous amount of money because when you read the deed, she has three witnesses on the deed. So she didn't do this blind. They told her she was getting a lot of money. They told her the terms were acceptable. <coughs> You'll see that in just a minute. And the reason that it gets to be important, and we're going to move on through, but what I want you to think in terms of is the Edgewood Land Company, French and Roberts had public information, and they knew who they could sell the property to because the Edgewood Land Company had bought some property out on Broadway, not on Atlantic Avenue, as the first edition where they had just done 200 lots. And so, Knoxville being a small town, French and Roberts know that uh, Edgewood is looking to buy more property. The Elmwood Land Company disbands. J.C. White, the grandson of the founder of Knoxville, um, becomes a member of, a partner in the Edgewood Land Company. And those guys are off to the races. And French and Roberts buy it, they sell it. And so when, the reason I'm saying this, I'm beating this dead horse, is that when you are going out every day, you're driving by opportunities that you don't think of calling. The for rent sign that's in the yard where you know that sign says for rent. The person who owns that property is a real estate investor. They may not want to be, they may want to sell the house, but they may want to buy something else that you have, or they may want to sell something else that they have. How many people are calling on that for insight? 
How many people are calling on for sale by owner sign? How many people are paying attention to people who go to a city council meeting and they get their butt kicked and they don't get the zoning done? Right? It's, we talk about how complicated the market is, but when you boil it down, we all we have to do as investors is monetize the information which is available to us. And so, what made this deal really hum is that this trolley had been put in going out to the Beeman Farm in 1885. The town was expanding so quickly that Beeman was beginning to develop his property, and this trolley line would go out to his farm, and it went right into was the border of what was the Elmwood Land Company property and what became the Edgewood Land Company property. So the Edgewood Land Company improves it. They build the lots are all 50 by 150 feet. It works out to be five lots per acre. In 1890, uh, uh, George Barber moves to Knoxville because of his health. He's, uh, uh, an, he's got an architectural practice outside of Chicago, DeKalb County. Moves to Knoxville because of the really cold winters in, uh, that they used to have in Chicago they haven't had this year. Uh, so it winds up that uh, when he moves here, one of the reasons he moved here was because of the new railroad connection in, in 1885 that had gone from uh, Knoxville to Louisville to Chicago. So it made it an easy train trip going north. And part of the reason that the community expanded so quickly. So we wind up that Barber becomes synonymous with historic designs. And this is the Edgewood community right here. This part where it says Edgewood, this is the 18, November 1898 map, and uh, my other map didn't show up. There it is. Look at that. <laughs> See, Ryan did this, and he made it cool, and I didn't know how to be cool. That's Ryan did this. So this is the map of the original Edgewood community, right? The original Park City community right here, which is this area right in here, these lower four streets right here. And this is the 100, approximately the 150 acres that Mrs. Branner sold. This was the hazing part. This was, all these farms all began to sell almost immediately. And so what happens is real estate developers pay a widow a fortune for her property, far more than anybody thought the property was worth and they still made a profit. Not only did they make a profit, French and Roberts, the real estate development company that bought it from them, they were just wholesalers. In the truest sense of the word, they were signing their contract going to back-to-back -back closing. They didn't have a dime of their own money in the deal. They put $4,750 to Mrs. Branner, and they got a check from the Edgewood Land Company for $10,000. They left closing with $5,250 cash. Total, they uh, they took a note, they assigned all of their, not Mrs. Branner's three notes to the Edgewood Land Company, and they assigned the balance of their profit to the Edgewood Land Company to be paid at the same time they were paying Mrs. Branner at 8% interest. Mm -hmm. So they got in and out of the deal, they walked away with $5,250 in cash, a note from the Edgewood Land Company for approximately $5,000, and no expenses because the, the difference in price is the difference in the money. Is that us? Is that here? Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. Silver Nissan Rock. That's effective. So, the Beeman property, thank you. This is, this is Lynette. Lynette. Lynette is the person that actually manages all of my repairs. I made her come tonight. Um, Lynette says that I victorize a project and it's not possible to actually get one done on budget if I come back into it a second time. <laughs> so what we want to do, and this is the answer to your question right here. $10,000, um, and this is the website everybody should have reserved because it's a lot of fun. It's the great bet settler of all time, measuringwork.com. It's run by some really anal economists who are who really do it because they want there to be accurate information as to 
be able to value things over time. But in 1887, $10,000, according to the Consumer Price Index, is equal to about $257,000 in 2015. The unskilled labor value of the money was $1,410,000. What is that? The unskilled labor value is what if you had $10,000 in 1887 to hire unskilled labor today, you would need $1,400,000 to be able to hire unskilled labor by today's standards. In other words, people worked for nothing in 1887. Now, the, uh, I didn't put it in, but the skilled labor value is $2.45 million. So if people want to talk about income inequality and the difference between those who are educated and trained in the skill and those who aren't, it's, we have records that show that it's been around for hundreds of years in this country. So trained people got 80% more money than somebody who was unskilled. 80% more money, it's not 10 or 20%. So the economic status is what is the real driver here. Because Mrs. Brander sold for $19,000, right? But the economic status had the same economic status today as you would have had in 1887 with $10,000 you need about $2.5 million in cash. So were these, were these real estate people doing well? So we're back to this. And uh, George Barber buys his lot, moves here to Knoxville, he buys his lot for $600 as part of this development, the first phase. So George Barber's lot is right there, right there. That's his lot right there, lot 31. And he buys his lot for $600. The Edgewood Land Company paid about $200 an acre for the land. It was The development cost back then was about $600 an acre, maybe $700, the best that I can calculate it. So they were all in, let's just make it simple math, at $800 an acre. They're selling lots at four to $600 a piece. So five lots per acre, 50 by 150, with an allocation for the alley of the street, works out to be almost exactly five lots per acre. And when they did that, um, they were making somewhere between simple math two and three thousand dollars an acre in sales against a cost of about eight hundred dollars all in. Which was the reason they could offer terms and they sold their lot to Mr. Barber for a hundred, I believe it's six hundred dollars with one hundred and fifty dollars down and four hundred fifty dollars on terms over time. Except their their note was a vendor note. Not a note to secure the, the, the payment, but a vendor note, which meant that if Mr. Barber built the house and he defaulted in any way on the land, they own the house, right? So the Edgewood Land Company not only self-financed it, they put themselves in a priority position to make more money if somebody defaulted. And they sold homes over time, over the course of uh, about 15 years to the So this is about where the 150 acres is today. It's not, it's not, these lines are pretty accurate. It's down here it's a little confusing because they've moved First Creek about seven times since it was originally done. But this is where the Pellissippi State campus is. This is about where the trolley line went. The, so you can see that this, Mr. Barber's house right here, the big red block, he is famous because he is an architect who sold mail-order catalogs. And Mr. Barber started out as a, car this is really important, he started out as a carpenter who paid attention to how houses were built, and he looked for a more efficient way to build houses. Remember what we talked about, the difference between investing in real estate? He looked for a more efficient way to build houses, and as an architect, he, um, he got to be doing that better, and he saw that he could sell his plans, people wanted to buy his plans, and so he put together um, uh, magazines that he would sell his plan books. His plan books were sold all over the United States before he came to Knoxville. But what happened when he moved to Knoxville and he built, the, he bought his house and built this lot, was that he recognized the labor in Knoxville was the same as the labor had been in Chicago. And so he starts putting in his plan book the cost of construction of building this home. 
you can buy this home and it'll cost you $1,800 to build it wherever you are in the United States. And nobody in America was doing that but him. Do you think his plans took off? Do you think he sold a lot of books? George Barber, never one time anywhere I can find, I can't, I, I, I've asked all kinds of people to see if they can find it, he didn't like the idea, he doesn't have one word about historic preservation. He only talks about new plans, new ideas, new ways to do things. We're going to become more efficient with building homes on new property, and we're going to change the way the size lots are so we can change the density of the neighborhoods and lower the land cost. Right? That's George Barber. So what happens is, we fast forward, and Barber lived in Park Ridge. He goes to church in Park Ridge. He goes up and down the streets in Park Ridge, and it becomes self-serving for him to sell plans to his neighbors who want to live in a nice house like he has. And so you have a wealthy group of people moving out to Park Ridge because that's what the advertising attracted, the right kind of people to live in their neighborhood. And George Barber was the architect who sold the plans to those people. Because he could then use the cost of construction in his next plan book to update his own cost of construction. Right? So. This is the current historic zoning overlay. Very quickly on this. All of these, issue, all of these properties are some kind of house, some kind of material. But there are 525, 528 properties. Okay, I'll give you the number, but I think there's 150, 125, 145 non-conforming properties in this district. And what that means is that those properties will be outside of the, historic, the, the primary requirements for the historic overlay when it goes into effect. George Barber made a fortune by Knoxville, Tennessee standards, selling plan books all over the United States. He became a partner with the Edgewood Land Company in 1895 because the panic in 1893 made everybody in the real estate business have problems, just like it made, just like 2010 made everybody in the real estate business have problems. Edgewood Land Company, this is my view, this is how I interpret the facts. Edgewood Land Company needed a partner who had resources and had income outside of selling lots in Knoxville, Tennessee or Chattanooga. George Barber's already in the neighborhood. He's selling plans. He's the perfect person to have as a partner because now the Edgewood Land Company could include a Barber plan when they sold a lot. Right? This is what I think actually happened and the reason George Barber became a partner in 1895 with the Edgewood Land Company, which is why when you go to Oakwood uh, Oak, um, and Lincoln Park, you see so many of the smaller barber houses because that whole area was developed after 1893 and the panic and after 1895 and the recession of 1897. So they came up with smaller designs and they shrunk the size of the lot in Oakwood so that they could get more lots per acre, lowering the cost so they could sell the lots cheaper. So if you were looking for a place to buy, and you know that Barber, this whole area right here is a Barber area, and they're trying to figure out how to restore it. And you know that he is responsible, and the Edgewood Land Company is responsible for all of basically Oak, Oak, Oakwood and Lincoln Park area. But that might be another good area to begin to look for housing because it's also going to be strongly in demand for the same reasons Lincoln Park is. So, how do we use this leverage for information? The value of non-conforming assets in the historic zone. Public information. How do we use it in the future to make money? The important part of everything is, right now, just think in terms of Beeman Park. I showed you where the trolley line was going, and it's going to Beeman Farm. Beeman Farm becomes Beeman Lake because he dammed up a really free-flowing stream the closest park to Knoxville was Montvale Springs in South Blount County. It took an all day to get there. It cost you, you could go there and have picnic tables and get amounts two dollars a day, which was a lot of money. So Beeman came up with the idea of damming up this stream, creating this lake, 
creating walking trails around the lake, putting up picnic tables. He renamed it Loco Okeechosee or something, Cherokee sounding name. But the electric streetcar goes in in 1898. It's Chilhowee Park today. Right? So the reason that this is important is if you're in Knoxville today, where can you think of that you could be between downtown Knoxville and a large recreational park that's going to be forever a park next to a body of water? South Knoxville? Iams National, Iams National, Iams Major Park, right? Everything basically sweep everything south of uh, Moody Avenue, north of Moody Avenue, Chapman Highway going over, 3,000 houses, a couple thousand apartments in the market area. Between Chapman Highway, I bid on a house. I, I didn't, someone that I know bid on a house. I, I told them what to bid. I feel bad about it. Uh, house was listed for $59,000. They had four bids. We were third, we were second high at $65,000, sold for $81,000. Because the people will be able to move into, they're, they're going to buy, they bought that house, they can walk across Severe Avenue, they can walk to the new uh, uh, park over there, uh, 30, uh, I can't think of the name of the park, Sutri Park. Is that what it's Sutri? Sutri Landing. Thank you very much. So, we talked about that three years ago in the market, how that was going to begin to change, and we can see it happening in real time. And once they get that big building out of the ground on, um, uh, on the river, it's going to be out of sight out there. So last, last month we talked about finding and buying in the specific zip codes. We're going to give them the $15,000 away. Even if you have to pay more to buy the house, you can still make money with it. And the reason that I'm saying this is that I handed out two papers, one January the 30th, 1887, and two days later, February the 2nd. Because in 1887, the French and Roberts did nothing more than pay attention to public education, public information that was effectively free. Just like Brian put up the community TV app where you can pay attention to what is basically free. And on the, back, on, on the fourth page that you have in the handout in Sunday is the recorded deed from Mrs. Branner to French and Roberts on the paper, on, it was the back page of the paper, um, in 1887, showing how much they paid her, and the next recorded deed was how much he, they sold it to the Edgewood Land Company for. And what's really interesting is that in two days later, three days later, the paper has new resort. For nearly a year, Mr. Beeman has uh, uh, been engaged in uh, creating this lake and this park where the trolley is turning around that's coming into downtown Knoxville. You don't need to be smart, you need to pay attention to public information. You need to pay attention to what is free. You need to think in terms of what does that do to real estate value. And Edgewood, the guys with Edgewood were smart enough to realize that if you, if you have a trolley going in front of vacant land and it's going to a park and the city's doubling in size, we've already got public transportation, we've got a place that people want to go and we want to go more why don't we buy that land and turn it into a subdivision and they just pay more than anybody else in Knoxville would for it? 